Right, then I see the door's just being closed, so um, we, we can get going. Um, it's great to have such a great audience here. Who, who knew this was the most exciting thing happening in Oxford on a Friday evening? Um, so um, I got, I've been asked to talk for no more than 10 minutes on Japan's changing um, demography. Given it's just about the most complicated changing demography the world's ever seen, it's going to be quite a challenge. So I'm going to go through this quite fast. I'm going to give you a lot of data, and maybe we'll have time for um, questions um, afterwards. But I'll start with just two general points. The first is that you cannot really understand any social, economic, or political policy in Japan without understanding the background that I'm about to explain to you. So all Japan's political, economic policy is linked to this changing demography. The other thing is that most people in Japan will know most of the things I'm telling you, which is interesting because I suspect if we did a quiz here, how much people knew about the British changing demography. I'm not sure that they would have that much information. So most people in Japan would know this. Let me tell you the story. It's an interesting story. So this isn't surprising. Uh, people in Japan are living longer. Uh, the age expectation, uh, life expectation has gone up rapidly in Japan. In 1950, men's life expectancy when they were born there was around 50. For women, it was about 54. By the time you got to 2019, 2020, uh, Japan had just about the longest life expectancies in the world. Many of you know this already. For women, it was around almost 88. For men, it was around about 82. So men and women who are born today have incredibly long life expectancies. Some Japanese demographers have suggested if you're born today in Japan, you have about a 50% chance of living to 105. Pretty good. Um, they also think that probably the first person to live to 150 has already been born if you can think that far ahead. So life expectancy in Japan is pretty impressive. Now, you would argue, and you'd be quite right, every country has seen big increases in life expectancy, and that's absolutely true. What is amazing about Japan is the speed of the change and how much it's changed and how much it's changed in comparison to other industrialized countries. So look at this. So this is Japan and the UK. 1960, you will see women lived on average six years longer had an expectancy of six years, uh, sorry, four years longer in uh, the UK. For men, it was roughly three years longer. 33 years later, so that's actually a tiny time span, those figures had been completely reversed. So then women in Japan in 1993, if they were born then, had a four-year uh, greater life expectancy than they did in the UK. So that's an eight-year change over a 30-year period. It's quite extraordinary if you think about the speed uh, of that life expectancy change. And it's the same with all the other industrialized countries if you compare them, uh, Western European and North American countries, if you compare them with Japan. So people in Japan uh, are living a very long time. There's about 70,000 people in Japan who are uh, centenarians, more than 100 years old. That is more than the US, which has twice the Japanese uh, population. It's more than China which has got 11 times uh, the Japanese um, population. And you could also see there just how quickly that number has gone up and is continuing uh, to go up very, very um, rapidly. There's a bit of a panic at the minute in Japan about very elderly people still driving cars. And they did a survey recently, how many people who were over 100 still had a current driving license. There are some out there um, in Japan. And importantly, life expectancy is continuing to increase in Japan much faster than it is in West European and North, Amer uh, North American um, countries. We'll come back to this a little bit later. Now, a lot of discussion goes on why people in Japan are living so long. You're probably aware of some of these um, debates. I mean, for a long time, people convinced themselves it was a measurement problem. And the measurement problem was that the Japanese def definition for, what do you call it, perinatal mortality, those are babies that are born around the time of birth and whether they were viable or not viable, the definition was different. And you only need a tiny little change in the number of babies that are considered to have been viable or not viable that died for to make a huge difference to your overall life expectancy figure. I think that problem has been solved, so I don't think that is the answer anymore. People talk about it being genetics, but of course... It, a, how could it change that quickly if it was genetic? But more importantly, if you look at Japanese populations overseas, in Hawaii, in uh, Latin America, for example, and if you control for variables such as class and education and income, they don't live any longer than the local um, populations. A lot of people think it's diet. Uh, as we know, Japan's diet is a very low-fat diet. Only about 15% of the Japanese diet is fat. I'm afraid to say West European diet is about 40% of our diet um, is fat. 
But then Japanese diet is very heavy on salt, and salt is not good um, for life expectancy. A lot of people think it may have something to do with social equality. The idea that Japan has developed in the post-war period is a very e uh, equitable society. This is particularly linked to a theory some of you may have come across by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett called the spirit level, which says that there is, well, they say here, the greater the income inequality, the greater the index of health and social problems. The other way around, in the case of Japan, if you've got great social equality, you have lower um, health and social problems. There's a big debate out there about why people in Japan are living um, so long. So that's people living a long time. That's one feature we've got to take into account. The other feature we need to think about when you're talking about Japan's demography is the decline in the birth rate. And this is also equally spectacular. So you can see here in the immediate post-war period in the late 1940s, you had a baby boom. Not surprising. Uh, Japanese troops were coming back from uh, Asian mainland, for example, and you had a big baby boom. And then 20 years later, you had, as you'd anticipate, another baby boom, because those were the people, the children of the first um, baby boom. For one exception, with one exception, in 1966, there was a very, very dramatic drop in the Japanese birth rate. I don't know if anybody here knows why that happened. Oh, good, you don't. I can tell you. It's great. So Japanese concept of time is not linear, it's circular. And the Japanese calendar works on a 60-year cycle, which is a combination of the 12 signs of the zodiac and the five elements. And once every 60 years, you get a combination of fire and horse. And way back to the 12th century, we have evidence that there has been a belief that girls who are born in that year will grow up to be very bad wives. There are many versions of this, very bad wives. And people had assumed by 1966 this wouldn't have any impact on the fertility rate. People just thought it was a superstition, it wouldn't be there. But it did. The fertility rate dropped by almost a third in that year because babies were not um, being born. There is some evidence that there was a slight peak the next year. They weren't being registered rather than being born to help their marriage chances. Interestingly, the next time this will happen in 2026, that's already being factored in. The expectation will be that there will be another drop in the fertility rate because of this um, unusual feature. So in, in, in 1966, the birth rate dropped to 1.58. You need a birth rate of roughly 2.01 in order to keep your population stable, to have a replacement um, level. And people thought, well, that won't happen again because that was just a one-off. That happens every 60 years. We've got our second baby boom, and there'll be another baby boom. But it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. And then in 1989... The birth rate fell below that famous 1.58 to 1.57, and that was what was called in Japan the 1.57 shock, the realisation there was never going to be a third baby boom. And the numbers have continued to go down, way, way down there, and way down below a um, replacement um, level. So if you take those two features, if you take your declining fertility rate, and if you take your ageing population you immediately get, so if you get to more people living longer, you immediately get a population that gets older. And that's happened in Japan, and it's happened in Japan faster than it's probably happened anywhere else, um, possibly ever. So you go back to 1990, you'll see that Japan and the US uh, had roughly the same uh, proportion of the population who was 65 um, or over, and they were both much younger than they were, the population was in Germany or France or um, the UK. But look at the Japanese figure, you can see how rapidly the proportion of the population over 65 um, has been going up. And look at the US, you can see how slowly um, it's been um, going up. Um, I found this in my files recently. It's a bit old, but it comes from an old newspaper. And it comes from a newspaper that was published in the late 1980s, when everybody thought Japan was going to become the number one um, economy in the world. And they said, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to compete with Japan? And what it said way back then, it says, well, have a look at this. Our predictions are that even then we can see that whereas the US is not going to age so fast, Japan is going to age very quickly. This will have an impact uh, on our um, economy. So what happens is if your population uh, is aging, less children are being born, your population pyramids change very um, dramatically. And this, of course, is an example um, from Japan. So you'll see in the 1950s, Roughly 60% of the population, 
that's these people here in purple, were of so-called working age. That's between the OECD definition of between 15 and 64. And that 60% was supporting just 5% of the population who were 65 or over. So you had a ratio of 12 to 1. You then get to, what's that, 2014. The ratio has gone from 61 to 61.3 of working population to 26, roughly two and a half. And it's changing all the time so that fairly soon by 2050 it's projected. We'll be pretty close to 1.5, i.e. there will be only 1.5 people in work to support each person who is 65 um, or over. And you can think of how that has huge implications for um, the society. This is interesting. This shows the projected year of the working age population actually peaking. This happened in Japan already 25 years ago. The Japanese population, working age population peaked. It's happened in China, interestingly, and that's all to do, of course, with the one-child policy. But look at some of these other countries. They've got years to go before their population age, um, at the working age population um, actually peaks. So you can actually model from this the potential of growth for um, your workforce and your economic uh, future uh, from that. So then we come on to the overall impact of what happens if you have a society where your fertility rate is way below um, your replacement level and you don't have, as you have in Japan, any methods of um, particularly of immigration. Now, this chart is extremely well known um, in Japan. Everybody in Japan knows this. It gets reproduced regularly in newspapers and so on. Reminding Japanese people what is likely to happen to the population until the end of um, the century. And I always say there are three estimates. The highest estimate is that the Japanese population, which at the minute, has gone, I think it peaked at about 127 million sometime in the late 1990s, is going to, at the highest level, decrease to around 90 million. The median estimate that it will decrease to roughly half and the low estimate that it will go from 127 million to around 50 million. A massive decrease in the size of the population. Curiously, that means the population size at, 20, at the end of this century will be almost exactly the same as it was in the 1920s. Interestingly, the figures when you see in Japan normally start actually from the peak and show the decline. They don't show the huge growth that happened before it then uh, began to decline. And Japan is already shrinking. So last year, um, Japan's population shrunk by about half a million people. That's, if you can imagine this way, the size of the city of Sheffield just disappeared um, from the population. And that rate of the population shrinking is rapidly increasing so that by, um, by about 20, 30 years' time, it would be almost a million people um, a year. So what will Japan look like in 2065? The life expectancy at birth will have increased uh, for women from current uh, 86 to 90. So people will be living even longer, and for men from 80 to um, 84. The number of the people over 65 will have doubled um, to around 40% of the total population. People of working age will be less than half the population, and the current population is estimated will have shrunk to about 88 million. As I say, it will be shrinking by about 1 million people a year. That is the population of Amsterdam. So Amsterdam and Amsterdam will be disappearing every year uh, in Japan, if you can imagine um, what that feels like. And as I say, this is already affecting all aspects of society, including pensions, employment and labour policy, migration and education policy. There's nothing going on in Japan that isn't related um, to this. And let me just give you one example. It's from the education system. So if you go back to 1980, 1992, um, at that stage, 18-year-olds made up about 90%, 96% of all university entrants. So almost everybody who went to university was an 18-year-old, a tiny number of 19-year-olds, very few more mature um, university entrance. And at that stage already, Japan had almost 75% of school leavers were going on to some form of higher education, one of the highest rates in the world. So there wasn't much room for expansion. And look what happened to the 18-year-old population. It's quite astonishing. Between 1992 and 2010, it declined overall by about 41%. If you can imagine a huge drop in the number of 18-year-olds who made up the population of students who went into um, universities. And this put massive pressure 
on Japanese universities. And interestingly, most, many of them were expected to um, close. There was a huge uh, press coverage of how the higher education system in Japan was expected to kind of implode and the number of universities would massively um, decline. In actual fact, the number of universities in Japan has actually increased. And this is a puzzle that I've been working on um, for um, a number of years. And that isn't the title of today's talk, but if you want to find out, that's the book you can go and read to find out the answer to that, uh, that puzzle. So I've done my um, 15 minutes, uh, which I was told I couldn't speak for longer than. But if there are any questions, I think I'm allowed to take some questions. Yeah, please. So uh, is the decrease in uh, the number of births driven by families stopping having any children at all, or are they reducing the number of children they're having? So when women uh, get married in Japan and have children, they are having almost exactly the same number of children that they've had in previous generations. They're having well over two um, per, uh, per uh, woman during her fertile years. The difference is women are not getting married and children are not being born outside of marriage. So the number of children born outside of marriage in Japan is still, it's about 2%. It hasn't actually changed for 100 years. Whereas in Western Europe, as probably people know, the children being born outside marriage is 40, 50%. Scandinavia, I think, first children outside marriage is 70 to 80%. That hasn't changed at all in Japan. So what's changed is women in Japan are not getting married, and therefore they're not having children, and therefore the population size is dramatically um, declining. And, sorry, the last one. Yeah, no, sure. Um, is, how should we think of that population in, in density terms? So like 60 million is the yeah. size of the UK, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So what is interesting is if you go to Tokyo, you think this doesn't feel like a depopulated uh, country to me. It feels pretty crowded. You go down to Osaka, uh, you know, and you think this is pretty crowded. It's a rural urban thing. You don't need to go that far into the countryside in Japan to find completely depopulated um, villages and towns. So I've seen figures that in rural areas, in some areas of Japan, Okayama, for example, 25% of houses have just been abandoned. It's a whole phenomenon. People have just walked away from their houses and left them. It's easier to do that than it is actually to try and sell them or anything like that. It's easier for, for various tax reasons. So it's a rural-urban issue. And the average age of some rural communities already is very, very high because there's mass movement to the, uh, to the cities, particularly if you've got small children. You would tend to move to the cities for their, um, for their education. Yes? What's the government response to this? Are they trying to encourage young women to have children? Are they paying them or anything like that? Or are they just letting it happen? So the government's belief is that the best way to increase the birth rate is to make it easier for women to have jobs and to um, be able to have families at the same time. So that, And there's some good evidence for this. I mean, you might be surprised to know, but the highest birth rates are generally in countries where the highest proportion of women are in work. And they believe that they need to therefore make it easier. So the government, to do them justice, has done a massive investment into preschool childcare. Japan has just about the best value and the highest quality preschool childcare to try and make it easier for women to go back um, to work. The problem, I think, probably lies more with companies that are very inflexible if women either leave the workforce for having children and then come back. And they're also very inflexible about women having permanent jobs that are not full-time. It's either full-time or it's not full-time, and therefore most women find themselves, if they have children, forced out um, of the workforce. The government's invested quite a lot. They've also invested a lot in trying to encourage men to get more involved in helping in families to make it more attractive um, to do that. I mean, sociologists in Japan will tell you what would really change the situation is if there wasn't this belief that you had to be married to have children, because actually that's what changed some of the population figures in Western Europe. But of course, the biggest variable by miles would be immigration. If Japan opened its borders and had more immigration, that we know would have a major impact on the population size. There's huge resistance to that in Japan for various cultural and uh, other reasons. They are putting more effort into technology, in you know, the belief that technology will help them out of labor market problems and so on, rather than immigration. But I have no doubt that eventually immigration will be the answer. Yeah. Just asking what you just said about immigration and investment in general. Yeah. Um, just assuming that the population numbers in Japan will develop as we've just seen those graphs. Yeah. Do you think that um, the Japanese economy in itself can survive this without this current influx of labor? 
would it be possible to have an economy based mostly just on capital? Or do you think that yeah. this would actually lead to economic decline? So, um, I mean, Japan is trying to have what they consider to be a very controlled form of immigration. So there are certain workers in certain key sectors who are being allowed to come in, such as the care workers. Um, I mean, it's not very satisfactory for anybody because care working, for example, you get to Japan, you get taught in the Japanese language before you go, mainly from Indonesia, Philippines, Southeast Asia. They learn the language. They go to Japan on three-year contracts. They're not allowed to go with their families. They become embedded. They become skilled. They want to stay, but then they're sent back again so they don't get any rights, and then another, thing, another group comes in. So the minute it's being done sector by sector, there's quite a lot of uh, sort of controlled immigration around the construction industry as well. Is it viable in the long term? I don't think so. There was one exception to this, which was that um, Japanese of Latin American descent, as large populations in Brazil, Paraguay, Peru, and places like that, there, was, uh, there still is an agreement that the descendants of those people are allowed to come and work longer term um, in Japan. And very large proportion of that total Japanese Latin American population have actually moved to Japan um, over the last 20 years there and settled. But that's not nearly enough not nearly enough to deal with the, uh, the, the labour problem that you're identifying. Yes? Why is life expectancy so much higher for women in Japan especially? Why is what, sorry? Life expectancy for women so much higher. <coughs> I think it is in every society. Am I right about that? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Is it physiological? I don't know. Um, I, has, does anybody know the answer to that one? Estrogen. Estrogen. Okay, estrogen. There's the answer. Estrogen. Okay, then. I did not know that. Did not know. It's a good question. Then. We've got one more minute. Uh, yes, please. So you said um, the population in Japan in general are very acutely aware of this problem, and a lot of, for example, the graphs are very heavily reduced. Yeah. So I guess two questions: one, why is that the case? And two, what's the general attitude towards this problem? Is it more like uh, it's sort of back of the head, and know it's there, or is it something that's always sort of publicised? Now, I think that's a really interesting question. I've often puzzled about that myself. So, I mean, the, as I say, people know these graphs, they know these figures, they see them regularly, they're sort of conscious of that. I mean, I'd love to do a quiz in Japan and here and ask people what's the size of the population, what's the, you know, the age of the population and stuff like that. I think it's a back-of-the-head thing. I think they believe that this will be resolved, that the government will find a way through. I mean, it's a little bit like us in climate change, right? There's a sort of, we know there's a big problem out there. It needs to be resolved. And I think they keep hoping that it will be and think that it will be resolved. There is still resistance, uh, general resistance, you know, towards mass immigration, which would be one way um, of dealing with this. There are still very conservative trends uh, in Japan as well that make some of this quite hard um, to shift. But I think there is a general consciousness that, you know, that something will have to change um, at some point. But that's a really good question. Yes. Uh, you said there was no third um, uh, baby boomer. Yeah. Do we know specifically why? Was that, was that generation particularly heavily impacted by these factors? So uh, I think part of the explanation might be that during the 1980s, you had a massive growth in the Japanese economy. People will remember Japan was going to be the number one economy in the world by the year 2000. And many women got pulled into the labor force. And many new industries were set up that women actually became heavily involved in, particularly IT, tech, and those sorts of um, industries. And they didn't want to be pushed back into the home. I think that's the truth of the matter. Uh, you know, Japan is a pretty liberal society. If you're a woman, you can have boyfriends, you can live pretty much as you want. The only thing that you can't do is have babies outside of marriage. Um, I think something like 25% of marriages last year were women were pregnant when they got married. So it's a huge pressure um, to get married if you, have, if you have children. So I think women did not want to be pushed back into the home. That's fair. I think it's as simple as that. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping again. Um, is there a particular reason? Is, is it just cultural that women can't have babies outside of marriage? Because I think in the West we've seen... Like, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think culture is a thing that changes incredibly quickly. I think if you ask people in the 1950s in Britain, they'd have been pretty horrified about the idea as well. I think culture is something that can change, and I'm sure it will change um, in Japan. I've had the signal. I've had the signal. I'm really, really sorry. There's another talk coming. But thank you very much for your time. <laughs>